Imagine, if you will, downtown New York City during rush hour. Subways roaring, elevators whizzing up and down, skyscrapers, cabs, idling in traffic, people humming in and out of buildings, over bridges, across streets, from 10 stories below street level to 180 stories above. It's a dynamo of activity and a complex network of electrical and telecommunication system. But what do I mean by this? So let's get into it. But according to even most evolutionary scientists, one single human cell of life is staggeringly more complex than New York City rush hour. Each of those 100 trillion cells functions like a walled city. Power plants generate the cell's energy. Factories produce proteins. Vital units of chemical commerce. Complex transportation systems guide specific chemicals from point to point within the cell. Centuries monitor the outside world for signs of danger. Disciplined biological armies stand ready to grapple with invaders. Despite this confession, much of the modern world teaches that if you believe in creation, that God simply spoke things into existence, well, your intelligence is pitiful. However, you're also in good company. Jesus said if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Christ took Moses' writing as plain truth. He authoritatively and liberally quoted from the Old Testament regarding creation, the exodus, and the flood. He never suggested that any part of Genesis was a parable or a fable. In fact, Jesus referred to Adam and Eve as real people. No matter what the world thinks of us, we should believe like Jesus. But you know, how can so many people be wrong? How can so many people be wrong, you ask? It's human nature to follow the crowd even when the crowd is clearly in error. The Bible says you should not follow a crowd to do evil. That covers our actions, yes, but it also covers our philosophies. It doesn't matter if the whole world believes in the theory of evolution. The Bible is our standard of truth. Besides, evolution is totally incompatible with biblical Christianity. If you think creation is a fairy tale, you won't find much else in the book of Genesis relevant either. You must eventually accept creation as a fact for any of the other great biblical truths, including God's standard of morality, to be significant in your life. Indeed, Darwin's theory of evolution was a daring attempt to make God's existence unnecessary. Evolution really is the origins myth of atheism. It was developed for the purpose of giving humans the freedom to act without accountability to a higher power. At its very core, atheism balks at the existence of an objective right and wrong. Obviously, not all atheists are ready to commit the evil their beliefs would allow for. However, to the atheistic evolutionist, humans have simply evolved into a society that currently frowns on theft and murder, but we could just as easily evolve into something else, and the results could not objectively be called good or bad. Blood could run in the streets, and evolutionists could simply label it as eliminating the weaker members of the species. Is it so surprising then that the horrors of the Holocaust find their underpinnings in the theory of evolution? An examination of the writings of Hitler and other Nazis reveal that Darwinism heavily influenced the policies of World War II Germany. Hitler labeled Jews as an inferior race and less than human, thereby justifying murder, torture, and ghastly human experiments in the name of survival of the fittest. And racism continues today because many people believe that some humans are more highly evolved than others. But racism directly contradicts the Bible, which says God in Acts 17 verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Friends, there was only one race, and that is the human race. It doesn't matter if you are white, black, Asian, Hispanic. We're all equal at the foot of the cross, and we were all created from the very same dust of the ground. 
I just want to make that very clear. But back to the subject of evolution, teaching our children the lesson that there is no absolute right and wrong is very dangerous. It has caused a disaster in our public schools, our court system, and for the very fabric of our society, a false understanding of human origins ultimately degrades society. Atheism offers no hope of purpose for life, but exhibit A would be the drastic difference between North and South Korea. If you stand on the 38th parallel, you'll see a very bleak and backward existence of the imprisoned people of the North. Look south towards Seoul and you will see a bright and free civilized existence. The core difference, South Korea is a Christian stronghold. North Korea teaches evolution and atheism. Satan told Adam and Eve that if they rejected God's word, they would be freed and experience unlimited human advancement. Instead, they were enslaved by sin. Today, Cuba, North Korea, and China aggressively persecute Christianity, all the while suppressing freedom, advancement, and hope, enslaving their people in unspeakable evil. Evolution clearly undermines Christian living. But what about all the supposed scientific evidence that proves evolution? The truth is that the theory of evolution is based on huge assumptions about things that happened in the unobservable past. Remember that the scientific method requires observation and repeatable research. So calling evolution or science doesn't make any sense. For instance, the theory stands on dubious dating methods. Suppose you enter a room with one door and no windows. In the middle of the room, a burning candle sits on a table with nothing else to do. You try to figure out how long the candle has been burning. You start by observing how fast the candle is currently burning. How many inches per hour, for example. Does that tell you how long it's been burning? No, because you don't know how tall it was when it started burning. Suppose a note on the table stipulates that the candle was, let's say, three feet tall when it was first lit. Now, you can calculate how long it's been burning based on how tall it was to begin with and how fast it's burning now. But wait, when you enter the room, the open door let in more oxygen. So now the candle will be burning at a faster rate than before. Even if you know the present oxygen level of the room, you wouldn't know what it was before you opened the door. Without an observer taking careful notes during the entire process, you can only guess as there are simply too many unknowns to make an accurate calculation. It's the same thing with carbon dating. There are simply too many variables. Scientists don't know how old the earth is because they don't know and can't observe what has happened in the past or how the environmental factors have changed. Amazingly, an entire religion has been established on these dubious assumptions. It seems strange then that evolutionists ridicule the faith of Christians. Believing in evolution requires far more faith than believing in creationism. Increasingly genuine Scientists suggest a young earth, which supports the biblical creation story. Bear in mind that even the most advanced techniques cannot detect 14C in specimens older than 80,000 years. In 1997, Wright began an eight-year project researching data typically ignored or censored by evolutionists. One of their discoveries was significant levels of 14C found in various samples of both coal and diamonds collected worldwide. The finding indicates that the coal and diamonds could not be billions of years old as evolutionists claim. Scientists also now know that the 14C-12C ratio has not been the same throughout Earth's history. For one thing, the amount of 14C in the atmosphere increased sharply around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Physicists Seuss and Lingerfelter have now shown that 14C is entering the atmosphere about 30% faster than it is leaving. When it comes to carbon dating, this means that a thousand year old specimen appears much older than it really is when dated by a method that assumes atmospheric equilibrium. In fact, the older a specimen, the greater the error, even when correcting for the known increase of 14C during the Industrial Revolution, specimens still appear older than they really are. 
However, the layer of water described in Genesis as surrounding the pre-flood earth could have shielded the atmosphere from much of the 14C entering from space. Thus, pre-flood specimens would contain so little 14C that they would appear to have been decaying for tens of thousands of years. Consider the world's population right now. Around 1960, there were only 3 billion people. In 1804, 1 billion. In Christ's day, only about 200 million people lived on the earth. Calculate this same growth rate back about another 2,500 years to the time of the flood, and you get just eight people, Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives. But now, use this same growth rate and observable scientific fact to project the world's population if man had begun multiplying, say, just 10,000 years ago. Never mind the millions of years the evolutionists postulate. We should be standing shoulder to shoulder, 100 deep, over every square foot of the planet. But where have all the people gone? Moreover, there are enough humans remaining graves or even artifacts to account to that many people having lived and died on the earth. Found in two pieces in Germany in 1983 by amateur fossil hunters, Ida, supposedly 47 million years old, was passed around the fossil collecting community until she ended up in the hands of a research team. Not too long ago, the media eagerly dubbed Ida the newest missing link in response to a press release bent on promoting the find rather than the science. Indeed, Ida has come under immense scrutiny by evolutionists as just another sham meant to drive DVD and book sales. Examine her photograph and you'll see a skeleton that looks identical to a modern lemur, not an ape. Moreover, her remarkably intact skin, fur, and stomach contents suggest rapid burial, consistent with the flood, and an age of thousands of years, consistent with the young earth, rather than millions. Remember also that not a single so-called missing link ever submitted as proof of human ancestry has ever been uncontested in the science community. Some have been utter frauds. That's important to consider the next time our evolution fawning media prints another fossil fable as truth. In 1990, Dr. Mary Schwarzer and her colleagues discovered some T-Rex bones to be partially unfossilized, adding to the excitement when examining the bone specimens under the microscope, Schweitzer team identified little reddish brown translucent round objects, red blood cells. These Findings can only mean that dinosaurs are much younger than previously claimed. Since then, Schweitzer continues to find soft, fibrous tissue and blood vessels in other dinosaur bones. Why have these never been found before? Probably because, blinded by their assumption of an old earth, scientists have never looked for them before. And true to form, Schweitzer automatically questioned the clear evidence rather than re-examining her assumptions. But when a creationist scientist does that, it's labeled unscientific. You know, I used to believe in the Big Bang Theory. I still do in a sense. I believe that God spoke and bang, it happened. As a matter of fact, the book of Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 tells us, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Controversy over the Big Bang rages even among scientists who believe it. There are many problems with the theory that simply can't be explained. For one thing, no scientific experiment has ever demonstrated that an explosion can produce order and inner working systems. By that logic, it's like saying you could toss a nuclear bomb into a junkyard and BAM! You get a Mercedes Benz. Yet blatant persecution of scientists who merely question it or other established scientist facts is widely practiced. Once highly esteemed scientists such as astronomers Geoffrey and Margaret Burbridge who dare to suggest different explanations find themselves censored, ostracized even without a career. 
Physics professor Dr. Stefan Marinoff actually committed suicide because of the intolerance he experienced in response to his non-mainstream work. When a scientist's conclusions contradict the Bible, it doesn't mean we should reinterpret the Bible. Thousands of true scientists believe in creation, but they are consistently silenced by the atheists who have a vice grip on science journals, academic privileges, and a fawning media who put the beliefs of faulty men above the word of God. The Bible teaches that creation was instigated by the supernatural word of God. There was no death, no suffering, no pain. Everything was very good. Evolution teaches that creation was instigated by a supernatural big bang. There was death and decay from the very beginning. The Bible teaches that a global cataclysmic flood formed the geologic layers and that mankind has been devolving since his creation. Evolution teaches that slow wind and water erosion formed the geologic layers over millions of years. Man has been evolving since the beginning. The Bible teaches only Jesus Christ can save the human race and restore us to paradise and only through grace by faith. Evolution teaches, as the devil said 6,000 years ago, that the human race can save itself and we will one day become like gods if we try hard enough. Honest science and logic show that our incredibly marvelous and complex world could never have evolved by accident. It happened as Jesus says it did, and it's crucial that we believe it. Psalm 33 verse 9 says, For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Sadly, many churches and Christian universities are compromising on this issue. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. If your pastor or professor suggests that God used evolutionary processes to produce the earth, ask them if this means the saved will have to wait a few billion years while God creates the new heavens and the new earth. Then ask if our new resurrected bodies will have to evolve from a single cell again. The book of Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10 tells us, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Which is harder, to speak a galaxy into existence or to change a human heart? Salvation relies upon God's miraculous instant creative power. When you toss aside the six-day creation account, you do more than clear a pathway to immorality. You remove the hope of salvation. Ultimately, something very simple but very important lies at the heart of someone who rejects biblical creation. If in the beginning God created is true, then God is the supreme authority and as His creation we are subject to Him. Fallen human nature doesn't like that arrangement. Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days? If so, praise the Lord. Then you can also believe that He will give you a new heart through a similar miracle of creation. Could we have a better hope than that? If God, cre if God can create the sun, moon, and stars in one day and hold them in place, how much more can God hold you in the palm of His hand and mold your heart if you let Him? Come to Christ now, brothers and sisters. And let him change you from the inside out. And you won't regret it. I promise you. But until next time, as always, this is John Tinsley with Everlasting Rock Ministries. And always remember, the truth never fails. God bless you.